article by two Senate veterans, a Democrat and a Republican, arguing against that tack, hands off the filibuster. Now, one of those is back with us from the show here, Brian Darling, a former aide to Senator Rand Paul. And we're adding the ACLU's Foz Shakir, a former senior aide to Senator Harry Reid. Now, Foz, because you're the new one, I'll have you start us out. What would be good about saving the filibuster here? Oh, I, I, I'm, I think for Supreme Court nominations, a lifetime appointment, it's important that that particular nominee receive a bipartisan 60-vote threshold. I think that that's fair. That's been the precedent for many, uh, and I think it should remain the precedent for every president going forward. I just think Senator Reid was right when he pulled a nuclear option for all other nominees in order to repair our democracy and accomplish tremendous gains for President Obama and our country. You sound defensive. No Nobody even brought that up yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was the right thing to do. I know it's going to come up, so I'm saying <laughs> you're, that you're it was the right thing to do. <laughs> All right, I know how this works. Uh, Brian, let me read from your article and give you a chance to weigh in. You make an interesting point here, and one that some people might be surprised to hear from a Rand Paul aide if, if they're making certain assumptions, but you write the filibuster by slowing the process and giving a bit of power to the minority party ensures important changes get serious consideration. It forces cooperation, and from our own experience, you and Jim Manley Wright, we can attest that that it works. Explain. Well, when Jim and I wrote that piece, um, we agreed not to get too, not to discuss the the uh, filibuster of nominations. It was more so in legislation. But right. the, I, I mean, when you look at the cloture rule, it, it does not make any distinction between legislation or a nomination. So uh, the, the, there really isn't a distinction. I mean, ultimately, I think Democrats made a huge mistake, and they're paying a price now for pulling the nuclear option trigger and getting rid of it on lower court nominees and cabinet. There it I mean, is. They Faz. are. There it is. Yeah, this there is. It is. And, this and is like an old couple. These... We, this is like the fight we knew was coming. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. But, I, I, but look I at all the nominations. Brian and then Faz. Sorry. Look at these nominations <laughs> that would have maybe been different had there not been a nuclear option. Had Republicans had to get 60 votes to shut down debate on nominations, you would not have had many of the nominees that have gone forward and passed with well under 60 votes right now. So I think that a president deserves to have his own team. When we pulled the nuclear option under Reid, we got approximately 100 judges confirmed. We remade the federal judiciary. It's a tremendous accomplishment for President Obama. And I think if you remember, you know, President Obama was dealt historic obstruction by Republicans. And I think Senator Reid was right to say we need to repair our democracy, pull the nuclear option, allow a president to pick his team. It accomplished a great amount. Now, I think you have some people People who I think shouldn't be in the positions that they deserve to be in. However, it was Donald Trump uh, who's responsible for choosing these unqualified people and putting them into positions where they shouldn't be. And I think it's up to the Republicans, all of whom have voted for him. They own this problem now. There's no reason why Democrats should have to vote for any of them because of the nuclear option. So let's look a little bit, though, at the legislative piece and the leverage here. Because, Brian, uh, you used to work for, for Rand Paul, who used the Senate to make certain points and put pressure on Issues that may not have had forget forget a majority. They may you may not have had ten senators with him. I mean, there was a period when he was pushing on the potential abuse of drone strikes and who would they target and the due process rights of Americans. And that was a lonely fight within both parties. Talk about that use and why that's important. Well, yes, he would joke that he was a member, a minority member of the minority party at the time when Republicans were in the minority. He was not even the majority faction of the Republican Party. So the only way he could bring issues to the forefront would be to filibuster. And we've seen three significant filibusters in the past few years and uses of the filibuster that were proper. Chris Murphy filibustered for gun control mm -hmm. just recently, just as recently as last year. He had two in 2013 with Rand Paul and, and Ted Cruz who filibustered it to slow government spending to put a focus on Obamacare. Now those are all legitimate uses of the filibuster. The problem I think becomes is if you get rid of the filibuster, you're going to get rid of the, uh, the, the rights of the minority, the rights of individual senators, and we're going to become more monarchical in a sense. We'll become more top-down, where your leadership and your president will have far more power than average members. And you can forget about Rand Paul and backbenchers like Bernie Sanders, for that matter, because they'll be much less important. It'll be all about leadership, what leadership wants to do, and that will sideline most members. And that's not what the way our founders put together this republic. So, Faz, I just looking wanted... at... Go ahead. 
Well, I just want to remind you of a stat. Before President Obama came into power, there were 68 nominees, 69, who were filibustered, right? 69 presidential nominees. Under President Obama, it was 79. Literally, so you had more than half of the total of nominees who had been filibustered just under President Obama alone. And that's why the nuclear option had to be done, because people were taking them hostage for political ends. And so I let me, I, I think let me take Rand this is... segment hostage for a second and, and push you <laughs> forward, because I get your point defending Reid, but when you look now to the Senate and what the Democrats yeah. are trying to do in the minority, Faz, you worked for Minority Leader Reid. What is your parliamentary advice over how they can use the legislative filibuster or holds or other things in what is a Republican and dominated era in Washington. Well, uh, the Merrick Garland example reigns supreme now. There's no reason to rush, certainly, Judge Gorsuch's nomination. This should be taken with as much slow, thoughtful, uh, uh, careful study as is uh, possible. And so I would urge the Judiciary Committee members to ensure that they exercise to slow down the hearings, to have multiple hearings over multiple days, to get answers to every possible question. Because if the Republicans now want to yell and scream about rushing this process, they have no leg to stand on uh, given their treatment of Garland. So I, I think Schumer's t taking the right posture. Slow it down. Hey, Brian, you get the bonus, which is the last word if you keep it short. Well, I would advise the Republican leadership to use the rules to steamroll Democrats by forcing a talking filibuster. The filibuster is about speaking, not about saying, I'm going to uh, object. Let's make them actually sit down on the Senate floor and speak until they collapse a Jimmy Stewart, Mr. Smith goes to Washington style filibuster. Or Rihanna, talk that talk. Brian Darling and Faz Shakir, thank you both. Hope you'll come back.